Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me as always, the warden of Nassau County, supreme leader of all spoilers, it's John. And hopefully this is a mini episode today, John. But I guess we'll see. Yeah, could go either way. It usually goes the one way. <laughs> <laughs> but we gotta, we, we need to comment on. Yeah. Would you call it's a it's a teaser? It's not a trailer. It's a right, teaser. It's a teaser trailer. But it was a surprise for me. But a tease is George R. R. Martin come out saying they're working on the bigger trailer. I've heard that. I've also heard Benny Elf and Weiss, or no, I'm sorry, I think it was Weiss. Who usually, I feel like of the two, he doesn't say much, Weiss. It's usually Benny Benioff does all the yeah, time. Yeah, Benny Off, yeah, right, 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 right. Benny Off is the uh, mouthpiece for that duo. But I think it was Weiss who said he wishes they didn't have to put together a trailer, a full trailer. His point being that the show doesn't really need a trailer necessarily. At this point, it's already the most watched show in the world. Everybody knows it's the last season. Why do they need a full trailer? And I see his point. I mean, obviously, I, I want to see a full trailer because I want to see some scenes from the actual season. Right. Some images, some clips from the actual season, from the actual show. Whereas this teaser, I did think it was great and I thought it got me excited. Well, first of all, before we talk about the teaser, let's just mm-hmm. comment how right I was about April 14th. Oh, you nailed it. You nailed it. And luckily, I was able to get that episode up before the <laughs> teaser came out so people can't go back. But if people go back and listen to our episodes months and yeah. months ago, you said April 14th. Even summer, I said April yeah. 14th. It just- and even before you decided on April 14th, you said X amount of weeks before Memorial Day. That's always, as- that's always been your biggest thing is the Memorial right. Day weekend. Because even as popular as the show is, you still don't want to have one of the episodes, especially one of your last episodes, on a day where people might be out vacationing, they might be out to, to parties, mm-hmm. might not, you're not going to get – you might not get the full participation in it. I think most people would watch it. I know if the finale was on Memorial Day, I would obviously watch that instead of going to a barbecue. Now, there's some people out there would be like, ah. Not everybody is us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not invested as, as, you know, as some of the community is to do that. There are a lot of people who just watch whatever's on HBO. It probably doesn't make the majority of their audience obviously, but there are people who just watch HBO. Sunday Night HBO is just a thing they've been doing since The Sopranos. All right, so teaser is called Crips of Winterfell. I had a feeling in the back of my mind that maybe we knew the announcement was coming, but maybe we'd get a teaser or an image maybe or something. Week or maybe be the final week we get something. Yeah. I definitely thought by the following week, as they were airing clips for the True Detective show, I thought, Maybe they'll air an actual teaser. Like, that'd be awesome. And then they did. And it was pretty awesome. What are your initial thoughts? Did you enjoy it? It's one of the better ones that they've definitely done. Uh, it definitely piques your interest. Of all things they could have done, of all elements that they could have had a, any bit of characters, you know, here's one thing I was thinking about. That season one... The first episode is really, it's about the start buildup. Mm-hmm. Now in this teaser, once again, we come all, I mean, we encompass this whole entire world, all these other characters and all these other villains and heroes and whatever you want to call them. And this teaser now, once again, puts the Starks in the limelight again. Like it's, the circle is now complete. It's going back and a shovel back to the Starks. I got that vibe also. And it leads me to my next question. Which is why is this teaser taking place in the crypts of Winterfell? Right, and that's how I was going to pee back to. I mean, they could have done anything. They, they could have had, mm-hmm. they could have had Cersei in King's Land, and they could have, you know, they could have. But they chose the Starks in the crypts of Winterfell at Winterfell. Well, I think to the teaser for season seven, which was it was John, Danny, and Cersei walking down there, 
given polls. Yes. And HBO could have done a teaser like that. HBO is not putting together this teaser. I'm sure it's Benioff and Weiss, some input. They could have made a choice like that. And the teaser probably would have been just as effective. You might even be able to argue a teaser like that, maybe one that features John, Danny, Tyrion, or Cersei, Sansa, Daenerys as the three queens. Not that Sansa's a queen. It's a reference to the Littlefinger line in the Storm of No, in the Feast for Crows when he says, The realm trembled from the War of the Five Kings. Just wait till the War of the Three Queens. And I'm paraphrasing it. It's, mm-hmm. That's not exactly it. They could have featured the Three Queens. I mean, any combination of characters would have been equally as effective. So why just focus on the Starks, bring it full circle, like you said, but why the Crypts of Winterfell? which have not played a huge role in Game of Thrones yet. People have been down there. They've, But when was the last time we were down in the Crypts of Winterfell? I don't think we were down there in Season 7. No, 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 People going down there and discovering anything or trying to learn anything about the Crips or giving out any major advice about the Crips. So that tells me that something's going to happen in hell with this teaser that, you know, there's going to be some explaining what's going on in the Crips of Winterfell. We know of theories about what the Crips of Winterfell means Mm -hmm. in regards to Lyanna's monument is probably a bad word. A monument, I feel like the Washington Monument, it's a giant thing, but. It is a monument to who she was, these statues in the Crypts of Winterfell, which are up until a statue for Lyanna. And does uh, Brandon Stark have a statue down there? Yes. Okay. And that was Ned's call to do that. Yeah, that was all Ned. That was all Ned. But other than those exceptions to the rule- It's always been a king. King of right. Lord. That's one part of the significance of the Crypts of Winterfell. Right. To me, there's like three theories of the Crypts of Winterfell that I've always heard. One, you go back to Liana's crypt, and there's everything and everything is rumored to be in there. This theory you've been high on for a long time, and I, I've agreed with you. There's something in Liana's crypt. Yes. This is one of the reasons why, being Ned did it because he wanted to put it down in there, but one of the reasons why also why he can't leave the crypt out in the middle of the forest in Winterfell, because he can't have anyone go in there. There's something in that crypt that is... That belongs to John about his parentage. Perhaps Rhaegar's harp. Jimmy Hoffa's body is in there. <laughs> Somewhere along the line. Yeah, something's in there. Dare I even bring it back up again? Is Dawn in there? Possible. It's a possibility. But here we got to think of the difference between the show and the book. I think it's possible in... The show's not going to do it. But, how, but how, 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 how can they not? I've been feeling lately... That maybe Dawn is just a metaphor. I used to always be so gun shot that Dawn was Lightbringer. I was really big on that. I'm kind of taking a backseat because that just. Wait, I'm sorry. Are you saying Dawn's not the metaphor, but Lightbringer? Yeah, just the metaphor. Right. Right. And the Sword Dawn is not Lightbringer. So I just think you're almost definitely as a show, you're 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 passing up on a a reason to connect the show with Lord of the Rings, where Aragorn has his Ranger Sword, and then is given. The Andrew, this is the same type of situation. Now all of a sudden, boom, now John's, you know, he's he's leveling up a sword. Like, why would the show not take advantage of that level up? Right. Well, it's also important to keep in mind, George Martin has said on many occasions, Tolkien is his influence and mm-hmm. how much those books meant to him and how he is maybe not modeled what his ending will be off the ending of Lord of the Rings, but at least use the template where it's a happy ending, but it's also a sad ending for the bittersweet ending. in. The Lord of the Rings, Aragorn doesn't receive... What's the name of the sword? I'm sorry. The Andriel. Andriel. He doesn't receive that. He has that from the get-go, but it's broken. He basically fights with a broken sword, which sounds cool in the books, but when Peter Jackson was adapting it, he said it would absolutely look silly, be introduced to Aragorn, and he takes out this sword, it's like half a sword. It's all broken, no matter how magnificent it looks. He didn't want to go that route just because you know the visual of it, when you're introduced to Aragorn, wouldn't work. So the point being in relation to Dawn or Lightbringer, is it's not modeled that way where he receives right, the sorry, story. Just, I'm just going on the non-reading version. Maybe he has it already, which I think we've talked about before. Well, yeah, so people do think that Law Claw actually is, in fact, Dawn. 
Mm-hmm. And that doing a lot of Lightbringer. We brought it up that it's kind of kind of funny how Longclaw belonged to House Warmont. Yep. You know, like it's just you know, like noble house, but barely you know, they're not <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, they're not like a great house. You would think that and we had these like nine left Valyrian steel swords. I, I know. I kind of wish we could go back and do our Valyrian steel episode again. I feel like we'd have a better outlook on it, and we definitely have more Valyrian weapons based on the expansion stuff he's done, the the anthology tales mm-hmm. he's he's written. But when we did our unfinished yet finished Jorah Mormont episodes, when we were talking about House Mormont, they're like a nothing house with no heralded history. They received Bear Island because one of the Starks won a wrestling match against a Greyjoy, and he just gave it to the Mormons. But it's not just the house history that is lacking, it's the history of Longclaw and how they got it. So I guess that's an argument against Longclaw being Lightbringer. But it's also argued for if if George isn't put a lot of information in there, Mm -hmm. there could be reasons for it. Mm -hmm. I wish we knew how House Mormon got a hold of Longclaw, but that doesn't mean Longclaw isn't Lightbringer, just because we don't really know the history of it other than... Mm -hmm. This family that lived in the woods had the sword for years and years. I don't want to get too deep into it, but it's also, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I understand that John saved Gior Mormont's life. And I understand that Gior Mormont knew that Jorah was exiled. He left behind ice. Uh, he left behind Longclaw, rather, and he had given up his lordship in doing so. If Longclaw had been with House Mormont for all these years, you would think that Gior would think, at some point, there will be another Lord of House Mormon, so don't give Longclaw to Jon Snow. Leave it for your grandchildren. I just, I'm sorry, I, I just had a huge, this is all based, this is complete assumption. This is just complete hogwash, actually. There's nothing in the books that even comes close to even referencing this. This is just, well, what do you think the possibility of, once again, Blood Raven or whomever, walking into the Raven and telling Giora the source should go to John. It's possible. You know what? It's very There's possible. No backing. I have no backing. I'm not saying oh, talk. It's, it's not a strong theory at all. But what's no, it? we could we could go through it and find backing. Giro Mormon's crow was always around Giro Mormon, and who's to say it didn't not bewitch him in some way, but suggest things to mm-hmm. him that made him crow king, king, right. king, right? The raven. So the raven croaked. The raven may be saying again, Ward saying. Give the, this sword to John because you have to. This is, you know, this is an important sword. I think it's definitely possible, and I do think it's possible that Longclaw is Lightbringer. But I am thinking it more likely that, just like you said before, Lightbringer is more of a metaphor than an actual sword. And I'm not going to be surprised if we don't get an answer either way. As far as the teaser goes, I think it's more what's buried beneath the surface, metaphorically. They're in the crypts of Winterfell, where all these former kings and winter. Mm-hmm. I don't know if Rob Stark's probably not Rob Stark's monument or statue. That's no, I don't think not built yeah. yet because he's the king that lost the North. Yeah, but I think that's the meaning of the Crypts of Winterfell. Here's Sansa, Arya, and John in with the history of of their great house, which has one of the longest histories of all the families in Westeros. John is still, I guess, technically, or I guess technically not king in the North, but he was named king in the North. As far as being heir to Winterfell, if he's king in the north, he must be lord of Winterfell. Although, I guess that's a bit murky, but he can't be king without a castle. So, he has to be lord of Winterfell also. And if Bran has given up his rights to Winterfell, then Jon's heir is Sansa. And Sansa is still technically married to Tyrion and the widow of Ramsay Bolton. But she has no children, so her heir is Arya. Right. Arya is not married, does not have children, so... After that, it's... Yeah, that's it. Those are the three heirs to Winterfell. So I guess that's the... Right. The symbolism of the crypts. And that, and that could be a reason why Bran's not there, since if he's given up his heir right to Winterfell, it's really just right. those then reliving Stark. But how about the voiceovers? The first one we get is... You said Liana? Is she the first one we get? Yeah, because John moves past Liana first. Okay. And it's like he looks back like, as if he hears something. And John's the first person we see in the trailer, right? In the teaser, right? Mm-hmm. Then you, then you see Sansa walking past Catelyn, and then you see Arya. Now, what's funny is Arya doesn't have any voiceover when she walks. Yes, I noticed that, yeah. Because then it goes back to John going past Eddard's crypt, and you have the voiceover by Eddard. To where then also you see John catching up and meeting up with Arya and Sansa. All three voiceovers are referencing... John. Yeah. And 
you see the first one, the first voiceover is Liana saying, you have to protect him. That stood out to me right away. You have to protect him. The second one is from Catelyn, where the made-up dialogue, seen from uh, season three. Benioff and Weiss' original joint. Yeah. <laughs> 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 they really should do that. <laughs> on yeah. the DVD and the Blu-ray when it comes out in a couple of years, wherever it is. <laughs> Special editions. <laughs> every time there's like a every time it's their old written stuff. Like yeah. just like a little scroll underneath. <laughs> Benny Elf and Weiss present a Benny Elf and Weiss original joint. <laughs> the original line coming up. Scene three from episode four. And the other line is all this horror that's come to my family. It's all because I couldn't love a motherless child. And then Eddard says you might have my name, but you have my blood. It's a dual reference in John. It's just that you have to protect him all the entire aspect. He feels mm-hmm. that John is, is at the utmost importance, especially you go back to what Samuel said, finale of season seven. John's the one to lead the fight against the others, I have no doubt. So that to me, that all comes into conclusion right there. Like that right now, there, there is no doubt who's leading the fight for the good. Well, I don't think there was any, at least for the audience side, I don't think there was any doubt that John would be leading this fight from season four onward, season maybe even season three onward. John would end up leading a fight against the others, especially not from like season five, season six, especially from the Heart Home episode. Right. That standoff, yeah, they, right, they gave that away then in my eyes. Mm-hmm. Back then, I guess he didn't say maybe in season five, there are still some people, maybe you probably, you know, oh, Danny was going to be the leader, blah, 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 or this one, you know, or maybe even status it's still at the time was still, but once you saw. Right. The way they did that hormone episode and the stare off between the Night King and John, right there and then, that was these two definitely in the show are going to have some sort of a one on one duel at the mm-hmm. end. It, it, there's, it's sending up to, I mean, it's definitely a possibility still in the books, but the show's definitely going to show a one on one duel of some sorts. Mm-hmm. And the voiceovers, like we said, they're all focused just on John. Now, also, I, I'm just thinking about this right now, it's yeah, John's no. real mother. It's mm-hmm. then the mother of Winterfell who's not who hates John, mm-hmm. and then it's the father, or who John thinks is his father. His mother, his stepmother, his lady mother, not really his mother, the mother figure who does not love him, and then the father figure who he thinks is his father. Everything they're saying is, in a sense, a progression of John's life. Liana saying, you must protect him on the day he was born, to her brother Ned, Catelyn talking about a motherless boy that she could not love as John growing up, John as a man going off on his own to say his vows, to take his oath, and join the Night's Watch to defend the realm. Ned saying, you may not have my name, but you have my blood, no matter what. And I think there's some significance in that quick cycle through John's life up until the point of King's Road. Now this next evolution of John, I think they're trying to tell us to keep in mind that John is a, he's not a Stark, but he's got the Stark blood. Mm-hmm. He's got the blood of the First Men, the Kings of Winter. Let me ask you, did you, watching this trailer, especially through the eyes of John, did you get any flashbacks of maybe John's dreams of the Crips? Yes, and I, I meant to ask you about that before, but I didn't think it was timely. There is mention of his dream in the Crips in season one or season two with Sam. Do they do they have that scene? No, that's all in the book, book only. It's, it's book only. It's okay. a book only reference. <laughs> Not a Benny Off and Weiss original <laughs> joy. <laughs> Okay. But, but to real to sum up real quick is John having a dream that he's in Winterfell he, in, in the crypts and he's going you know he's going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and all the kings of Winter are there looking at him almost maybe angrily as if he doesn't belong there and he's looking for something right but he doesn't know what right and it's the basis for the going back again to the theory of Lyanna's crypt and Lightbringer Rhaegar's harp the truth about who he is. Rigor's divorce papers from <laughs> Ilya, whatever, whatever is in there. Read this first. <laughs> yeah. They should get like an excerpt. <laughs> the show should get like uh, an excerpt of, uh, do some sort of like CGI of uh, Marlon Brando playing Superman's father. Hello, hello. As Rhaegar, kind of right. like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That'd be pretty funny. We do have that aspect of maybe, you know, thinking, I was thinking about that dream. But then we do see the Stark girls, the Stark sisters. It tells Ben's back to it's just it's these three Starks in mm-hmm. the crypts. And then what do we see? We see the feather that we've seen that Robert gave to Liana's crypt. That Sansa, someone mentioned that she took it with her after the little thing meeting in season five. But I thought she put it down back 
on Liana's oh, palm. Oh, I'd have to watch that again. I didn't notice it if she did. It was definitely there when they went to the crypts right, again. Right, right, uh, right, right, right. So was she putting it back on the same way that Robert did? I don't know. I, I got to watch that scene again, actually. Now. Uh, yeah. I don't think that. It would make a lot of sense if that was the case. Right. It, it, would, it would even make sense if she took the feather. But then she would need to know, I guess, understand the significance of Ned and Liana's relationship. Not the significance, right, but, 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 but how much but, Liana meant to Ned. But Robert was the one who put the feather there. So why? how would she know that Robert put – you know, why would she take – you know, I don't know. All right, well, then it goes back to Winter's Coming. I always was of the impression that the feather was there in the first place. Robert – Just picked it up off okay. the ground. Okay. So we don't really know who put it there. No. But I guess it doesn't matter. It's just the significance is it's Liana and the past and it's Ned and Ned's relationship with Liana and everything that has happened because of it. But the feather freezes as the ice comes rolling in. Right. Which- and that's something I wanted to bring up a little bit because I, I was just trying to find a kind of connection with the feather of why we see this feather again freezing up. Some have said the feather represents Sansa and Gendry getting married. At the end. Oh, Jesus. How? And all of the symbolisms throughout the whole entire show that, you know, Genji was called a bird without feathers, and they call Sansa a little bird. It's really where Genji is Robert and Cersei's child, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But. Oh, come on now with that. Genji's not Robert and Cersei's child. That's a strong theory. It's just, it keeps on, it's just not going away. A lot of people now are coming up with it, are thinking it. There's no way that Cersei has no knowledge that she was pregnant and had a kid, even if she's hiding it and she just gave Gendry away. But that's not Cersei. And yeah, but doesn't it? But doesn't in the does it in the books? Do they ever talk about a miscarriage that Cersei says she had a miscarriage? That's a thing. I don't think so. No, I know in the show they talk about it. They show that they had. This is one of the, the references. You know, is that conversation mm. with Robert? Like, oh, just once, and then she has that conversation with Catelyn. Cersei calls baby, you know, he was a fighter. And that's Gendry oh, okay. calling himself a fighter. You know, I'm yeah. a fighter. Yeah. But I'm trying to think back to the books. I, well, I, no, because no, no, in the books, what I'm citing is Cersei's chapter, and it's great prose when she goes through this, and it's a reference to, I'm not sure which Greek mythological figure, but she talks about Robert was so drunk when he would come into their bed, they wouldn't have actual sexual intercourse where Robert there was no penetration. She would get him off in different ways. And she references like a BJ because she says, it's an awesome line, I would eat your heirs. I would eat them all. Mm-hmm. And that's how she thought of it. And that's how much she hated him. These are all of your heirs to your drunk, stinking line. You know, the issues of your body and I'm swallowing them whole. They'll never be alive. It's real dark and real disturbing. It's a real good insight into Cersei's mind. But there's never mention of Cersei having a miscarriage in the books. No, I mean obviously they've they consummated the show, they consummated I mean, they, their marriage. Obviously, I was mistaken with my timeline last week when I talked about that scene between them and how there was a semblance of a relationship or a time when Cersei was happy. There was, but it was only a few days. It was until he came stumbling in and he called her Liana, right? And then it was just all downhill from there. Mm-hmm. I do know in the show they have given some symbolism of of that. I will, you know, there has been some. My rebuttal is. If the whole entire thought process of the Federal represents Sansa and Gendry, and we think that they're going to live and maybe possibly have some sort of ruling ability over Westeros, how do you explain the Feather being the first thing we've seen freezing over? Wouldn't then that show that that Feather represents Sansa and Gendry that they die? Isn't that like a double-edged, isn't that like a double-edged sword then? It could be looked at that way, yeah. You know, that, that's what I was just thinking about, you know, so I don't know. I think we're, I mean, that's what the podcast is all about, but I think we're reading too much into whether the feather freezing means anything. I think it's just, it's meant to represent Liana and John's life. I think it's just more the ice representing the coming of the, the White, White Walkers, Walkers the right. others, the Night King, more so than what gets frozen. The fact that it gets frozen representing something in particular. But the other thing I wanted to touch on was the statues and mm-hmm. the monuments of Arya, Sansa, and John, which we see in that order. You're right in saying you can't really tell if the Arya and Sansa statues picked older versions of themselves. I think they do. John's definitely does. That's an older John. Mm-hmm. What do you think? The Arya and Sansa ones look on par with the age. Possibly older John's that you just said is definitely, and it looks definitely older. And 
I know a lot of you know a lot of people are really counting out John now lately, and it's really disheartening that I'm just trying. Maybe they're getting in a bad mindset that maybe he is going to die. But I go back to what George said: there won't be any stories of John and Arya and Sansa in a post story. Mm-hmm. So did George give it away that they live? Is it possible that John lives? In a song of ice and fire, and dies in Game of Thrones, though. No way, how they'll do that. I don't think so either. I don't think he, I don't think he's dying. I, I don't. I'm not 100 percent positive. Tony thinks he's definitely a guy. Have you listened to Tony's past couple of videos? He's like, oh, he's a definite goner. He has to die. So then, how does he explain his first death? What is the point of even including that? I know a lot of people are. I think I think what John is. He was brought back by magic, and his life will be given out when the magic ends. But they don't touch on magic in. Game of Thrones, other than the well, fact that he, he woke up back again. To life. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, back to life. that's the magic, but then it's like, oh, he's back. Cool. We've talked about that before. Arya and her, <laughs> Arya and her gut wound with the sword are, that's my least favorite part of season six. But my second least favorite part is the lack of, not necessarily explanation, because how do you explain somebody coming back from the dead? But, but just they, they, the, the lack, lack of, of surprise and almost like, it's like, oh, oh cool, it worked. Like they've seen something like that before. Just the lack of really what we believe. The lack of ghosts being involved in his re- resurrection, which yeah, that's I very think is different than mm-hmm. Barrack kind of took back to life and Annette and Calvin in the books. I you know, it all goes back to what George said about, you know, the coming back and they all well, think that John's a, a fire wit. Well, at least with Barrack in in both cases, but in Game of Thrones his resurrections are explained and are more of a factor in his storyline and the scenes that take place around him, much more so than John's resurrection. Beric's resurrected and he explains it as best he can. Thoros explains it as best he can. His men are in awe that he's able to do it. It's a big part of his storyline. Same thing happens to John in a different way. It's no kiss of life. It's no multiple resurrections. It's, it's like almost shrugged off. And I don't know if that's a deliberate choice with Benioff and Weiss, or they were just trying to gloss over that. But if they're going to gloss over it, why include it? It's a, a pivotal scene, likely, in A Song of Ice and Fire, but the way they're treating it in Game of Thrones, he didn't really have to die other than to get him out of his vows, his oath to the Night's Watch. Mm-hmm. That's really all that accomplished. A bit of a change in his character, a bit of a darker edge, but he still does the right thing. He still wants to save people. So what was the point of that scene then? And I hope they explain it more. You know, even Melisandre, she's more rocked by herself being wrong about Stannis than she is that she was successful in raising John. Mm-hmm. It's almost like she was defeated when Stannis died. And I'm talking just Game of Thrones here. She was defeated when, obviously, she was defeated when Stannis died because it meant he was not Azor Ahai reborn. And she remained defeated. She performed whatever magic she performed on John half-heartedly. She was not super relieved or rejuvenated when he came back, at least not to the extent that she was. <laughs> she wasn't as excited as she was when she was burning Shireen after, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you'd think she'd be like, oh, it worked. I got to go burn somebody. But, you know, no more burnings. I don't even know how that relates to the teaser or what we were talking about, how we got there. Uh, just the fact that, you know, like, a lot of people are just on the on – the- well, that John is, there's no way John is going to make it out of this life. Yeah, right, right. I can't say for sure. I'm not 100% positive that he does, but I'm like 95 to 99% positive that he lives. That's not to say main characters won't die. That's not to say one or even two of the, of the big three, John, Danny, Tyrion, won't die. But I don't think it's John because Daenerys is still set up as. If you think about it, Daenerys is still set up as the savior, as Azor Ahai, reborn. I'm trying to think of anything else. I'm trying to think of the, you know, we see the wind coming in, the cold breath, the cold air mm-hmm. blowing in. John and Arya take out their swords. And you said something about that before we started recording. Like I said, I don't think there's any significance to John and Arya taking out their swords as their initial reaction. And then Sansa standing in the back. That's how they are as adults with more responsibility. In a situation like that, Sansa's obviously not going to be much use with a sword or a knife. I don't think she's ever even picked one up. She's a noble lady, first and foremost. And really, that's the only thing she is as far as what her abilities are. So she's going to stand in the back. 
She's not running away. Where's Rickon's statue? You think Rickon gets a statue down there? Well, John said it in the show. He said, have him uh, buried next to my uh, my brother, my, uh, next to my father or something. But will he get a statue, though? Or does he just uh, get buried in the ground? <laughs> He's just there. <laughs> the statue of him uh, running from an arrow. Yeah. Let's we'll just bring that kind of like full circle. On. Just ending up uh, real quick before we go on and on about the, the teaser, I think. Yeah. Brand not being there. The trailer. Did you get a sense of maybe the connection of the Night King and the others and the Starks having a connection? The dead Starks. The Kings of Winter having a connection with the others, actually. Like a shocker that that'd be like, like a twist. Yeah, I was I was thinking the same thing. It's been referenced in the books. When they reference in the books, they're talking about the Night King as the historical character. The Night King, the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, mm-hmm. who as legend goes, had an intimate relationship with one of the others, one of the White Walkers who was a female and consummated a marriage to her, set himself up as the Night King, the Starks and the Wildings, the King Beyond the Wall and the King in the North had to ride to Castle Black and take him out. When Bran hears that story, old man says, maybe it was a Stark just like you. That's not confirmed, but I think the real connection is the Night King the essence of the others, of the White Walkers, the metaphor for ice, for cold winds, for winter. And then you have the Kings of Winter. There is at least a thematic connection between House Stark, Mm -hmm. Blood of the First Men, and the others. I don't know what that means for Bran, because I've never been a subscriber to the Bran Becomes the Night King idea. There may be some evidence for it, but I just don't like that idea. And I feel like the Game of Thrones version of Bran kind of, it changes what my thoughts of Bran are, and it confuses, it muddles the Bran character from A Song of Ice and Fire. We got to keep in mind, he's not some tall, lanky kid who's probably almost 20. You know, he's, <laughs> he's still, what, eight years old, nine years old? Right. So, he's an innocent kid getting all this knowledge, and before Game of Thrones, I wouldn't have thought that Bran would ever be leaving where he was. I thought he would become part of the Weirwood and help out by communicating through the Weirwood, by communicating right. through Ravens. Right, you thought he'd be more like, more like Blood Raven, just staying in the Weirwood. Right, like he would just become Blood Raven. And maybe that is the case in A Song of Ice and Fire. I, I don't see a reason why he would have to leave there, except that the reason it had in Game of Thrones. That was Bran's journey, and he reached that destination, and he comes back and he says, I'm the Three-Eyed Raven now. All right, well, what the fuck does that mean? You're just hanging around Winterfell all day, looking at fire. You can go around, you can see the past, future. It's almost you become a, that character has become a a narrative device, a plot device, a way mm-hmm. to figure things out. And I don't think that was the intention George Martin has for the character. I don't think that's how the character will end up in A Song of Ice and Fire. Or if it is, it's for it's for different reasons. He's not going to be a just a way that we can figure out the past. I don't know. I don't think he becomes the Night King. I don't think that he turns evil. I think that there is some connection between the others, the White Walkers, and the Kings of Winter, but I don't think it means that Bran will become the Night King. Are you feeling that more so that he that he will? I've always been up in the air yeah. on the uh, on that theory. Definitely see it. I, I just always thought that could be the possible third twist. Yeah. There's definitely a twist coming. It's being set up that there's something about the Starks, I think. There's some unknown truth about them. The thing that gets me with the Starks, we said it before, John is the king in the north, Lord of Winterfell, Sansa's his heir, Arya is her heir, but John's not a Stark by name. He's either Jon Snow or he's Aegon Targaryen. Maybe Daenerys names him Jon Stark. She can do that. But he's got to find out the truth about himself and he's a Targaryen. He can't go calling himself Stark. At least not if he's going to be king, which he is the heir to the Seven Kingdoms after... Well, how does the lineage go then? The Mad King, Rhaegar, and then him. Well, then the first Aegon, Rhaegar's first Aegon, and then him. Right. But he can't do that if he's Jon Stark. But, well, it's just like, you know, it's again like a Lord of the Rings. Become who you were born to be. He's got to take the part on being a Targaryen. Well, it's, it's kind right. of like season, season seven with Theon. You can be, he has made the choice. You can be both. You don't have to pick and choose. Just, you can be both. But he's got to be a Targaryen. That's his, it's his. his you know, his birth name, unless he just thinks that I'm more of a Stark. But even if he does, he can't hide the fact that he's a Targaryen, and John's not one to do that, I don't think. Mm-hmm. But what I'm getting at is, all right, so then Sansa's the Lady of Winterfell, Sansa Stark, but she's 
going to have to marry somebody at some point. So what happens to the Stark name? I've always wondered that what happens mm-hmm. to the Stark name. That's why, you know, before Game of Thrones season six, I was... Rickon. I always thought it would be Rickon. I thought Rickon would be the Lord of Winterfell because I thought Bran would just stay beyond the wall as the Blood Raven's student and eventually become what Blood Raven was. And Rickon is the Lord of Winterfell because he's Rickon Stark, a male, and he'll marry and have more kids. And that makes sense. But now there's no, with the exception of Bran, there's no Starks. There'll be no Starks. Unless somebody's named a Stark, and they'll have Stark blood then, but that doesn't feel right to me. Right. Like, as not as a kid with someone, it's like, oh, he's going to call him a Stark, we have to. Even if it's Gendry, and she's like, all right, well, I'll make you Gendry Stark. He's not Gendry Stark. If anything, Gendry, Gendry Baratheon. And it's not going to end with House Baratheon, you know, ruling Winterfell through marriage. That's not going to happen. Anyway, I guess that's about it on the teaser. I thought it was great. It got me very excited. I didn't feel the need to watch it over and over again. I don't think there's anything hidden in these teasers. I think it hints at things, which is great, but I think it's more metaphorical where the story's going, but we kind of already knew where the story was going with what this teaser hints at. Do you have any final thoughts on the uh, on the teaser? No, not that I can. Not anything worthwhile. All right. Well, thanks for listening. You can find us facebook.com slash The Promised Princes. We're on Twitter. At Princess Promised. We are on Instagram, but we don't really post on there. John's on Instagram too. Yeah, I, I don't even know how to post on there. We're not really selfie guys, so it don't matter. Read the Westerosi Companion at theprincesthatwerepromised.com. You can find us at Apple Podcasts. We are in the Google Play Store. We're on Stitcher. We're on SoundCloud. We are on Spotify. We are on YouTube. We're all over the place. And we are rolling out our lead up to the final episodes. Game of Thrones. So stay tuned and we will speak with you guys next time.